All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our next teaching session. This one we're going to be talking about congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema. Pretty excited about this one. It's uh, very interesting to me, the way the heart works. Um, just like every episode that we start with, I like to start with anatomy because that's the basis for the way everything works. If we start with the heart, we look at the right side and the left side. So on the right side of the heart, this is where the venous blood comes back from the body without oxygen. It's a very low pressure system and blood is sent to the lungs to pick up oxygen and go to the rest of the body from the left side of the heart. So the left side of the part heart has much higher arterial pressures and his job is to send the oxygenated blood to all of the organs. Importantly, when we're thinking about congestive heart failure especially, it's important to note that circulation is a closed loop system. So anytime we're looking at the way the heart works, if one part of the heart is not functioning properly, blood is going to back up and this causes congestion. And blood backs up into the area just previous to it. So if blood is coming from the body and into the right side of the heart and not being pumped to the lungs efficiently, fluid is going to back up into the body. Whereas if the left side of the heart is not able to pump efficiently, blood is going to back up into the lungs. And what happens when we say someone has heart failure is essentially that the demand of the end organs is exceeding the capability of the heart to pump blood to them. So there's two types of heart failure. There's systolic heart failure, which basically just means that the heart, for whatever reason, is floppy or weak and doesn't have enough power to get the blood where it needs to go. And the second type would be diastolic heart failure, where in this instance, the ventricles are just not able to fill enough. Usually they're stiff and really non-compliant, so there's decreased room for blood to even fill that left ventricle. The ventricle might be able to squeeze just fine, it's just that there's not enough volume allowed in there to push out. Either way, whether it's systolic or diastolic heart failure, both of those types will cause backup of blood into the rest of the system. So one way we can measure the function of the heart, you'll commonly hear something referred to as cardiac output. And this is essentially just the volume of blood that the heart can eject per minute. And there's two very important variables that go into cardiac output. One is stroke volume, and that, especially here we're focusing on the left, the left ventricle. This is the milliliters of blood that are ejected through the heart with each beat. And another component of cardiac output would be the heart rate. So everything that the heart is able to eject, the cardiac output is dependent on how much blood is there to start with and how fast it's being pumped out. One very important factor is that stroke volume is determined by three different things. Mm -hmm. There's preload, which is the amount of blood in the left ventricle that's sitting there waiting to be ejected. There's contractility, so that's the ability of the actual muscle to contract and eject that blood out of the aorta to the body. And then there's afterload, and that's the amount of blood that's left in the ventricle after the heart beats. So let's do an example. Let's say that the average heart in the left ventricle can contain about 70 milliliters per minute of blood. And say the average heart rate is about 70 beats per minute. That means in a normally working heart, the cardiac output would be 4,900 milliliters per minute, or roughly 5 liters per minute of cardiac output. So if you put that in context, if you have an average heart that's beating 7 times a minute in an average size adult body with 5 liters of blood volume, your entire blood volume is circulating through your heart every single minute. When we put cardiac output into the context of heart failure, there's some other factors that we look at. And really, a lot of this depends, again, on the left ventricle. So there's something you'll hear referred to as ejection fraction. And this is a simple equation, which includes the amount of blood that's pumped out of the ventricle with every beat, divided by the total amount of vo volume that the chamber can contain. So if we take our previous example of 70 milliliters per beat, in this chamber. In a chamber that can hold about 110 milliliters, that gives us an ejection fraction of 64%. And this is pretty average for a healthy adult. With each beat, 
the heart ejects just a little bit more than half of the blood that's in there ready to go. When we look at ejection fraction in patients with heart failure, borderline heart failure would be classified as 40 to 50 percent of the volume of the blood being ejected, and heart failure is anywhere from 10 to 40 percent. Now this is what it would look like on ultrasound. You will hear patients refer to echocardiography or an ultrasound being done of their heart, and this is how we actually measure those volumes that we just talked about to explain ejection fraction. So here you have a normal heart beating, and you're able to see all four chambers of the heart. The ventricles are the two bigger chambers here and the atrium here, and you can see how it's bouncing up and down, squeezing all together, nice good concentric squeeze. Everything looks normal. Now if you compare that to a heart that's got some heart failure going on, you see a big dilated ventricle right here and it's not beating very well or very efficiently. So that's a heart that is kind of floppy and distended and is um, full of blood. It's got very poor squeeze. So when we talk about diastolic heart failure, this is a little bit different. This is where you have that stiff, crowded, really firm ventricle that doesn't allow for much filling. So this is a heart that has reduced preload. Now we're still measuring ejection fraction, so that's amount of blood that's able to be pumped out divided by the total amount of blood in the chamber. However, with this chamber that's stiff and dilated and doesn't have much room to fill, we might have a heart that's able to eject about 44 milliliters per beat of blood, but the chamber might only be able to hold close to 70. So what that does for us is it gives us an ejection fraction of 64%, which is a normal ejection fraction, but this is still not a healthy heart because 44 milliliters per beat is just not enough blood to get to the rest of the body and perfuse those organs. So there's different things that cause heart failure. It can be caused by heart problems like an old heart attack, uh, valvular problems, medical problems like hyperthyroid, infection, myocarditis, high blood pressure, problems with the lungs. We talked about COPD last time can lead to right-sided heart failure. Sometimes drugs and alcohol can lead to uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. You'll hear it referred to as. And then patients can have heart failure that are just non-compliant with their medications. One of the major causes of heart failure in our society today is STEMIs. You'll see here, this is a heart that's had a heart attack before. In the left anterior wall, there's a scar that's formed, and that's an area of the muscle that's been without blood flow for a little while. And you'll hear it referred to as time is muscle. Well, this is exactly what a heart attack looks like when you're looking at a cross-section of a heart. So you can imagine that if you look at the rest of the muscle of this heart, it's nice and strong and can beat, but if you're missing an entire wall of your ventricle, that's going to affect the heart's ability to pump blood to the rest of the body. Here's another look at a STEMI scar. This one is actually septal, but you can see here there's a very thick wall on the side and then the septal scar, that's muscle again that's not going to be able to contract very efficiently and send blood to the rest of the body. Left ventricular hypertrophy, I know you probably see this on a lot of the 12 leads that you obtain. This is a consequence of really long, chronic, uncontrolled hypertension. The heart is a muscle, just like any other muscle in the body. And if muscles are pushing against a large amount of resistance for a long time, they're going to get bigger. That's just what they do. But in the case of the heart, this isn't necessarily a good thing. If the heart is pushing against very high systemic pressures, just like any muscle, it's going to get bigger, but it's got nowhere to go except inside. So you can see here that it, as the muscle grows and is pushing against those high pressures, it's going to make that cavity smaller where the ventricle can fill, and that's going to reduce, reduce your ejection fraction and cause diastolic heart failure. One other thing I like to note about this picture is if you look at the, the area of white in the middle here, this is called subendocardial ischemia. Now the muscle here has gotten so thick that blood is able to perfuse this part of the muscle here from the inside. And there's blood right here. If you look, this is your left uh, anterior descending coronary artery. That little tiny artery is supposed to feed this entire thick muscle. And it's just not able to do that. So what you see happening is these superficial coronary arteries are able to perfuse the top part of the muscle 
And from the inside, there's some muscle that's getting blood from in here, but there's a middle layer of muscle that's not getting enough blood flow and it looks white and ischemic and that's why. Now, one other cause of heart failure would be cardiomyopathy. Typically, this is caused by infections. You'll hear uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Sometimes alcoholics will get this too. It can be caused by nutritional deficiencies as well. But if you look at this, it's just a big floppy heart that's got not enough muscle to effectively perfuse and get blood out of the heart to the rest of the body. When we look at these end-stage heart failure patients, one option that they have is an LVAD. We'll talk about that in a separate lecture, but when heart failure gets too bad to perfuse those organs, this is an option for bad heart failure patients. Now, there's lots of consequences when the heart begins to fail. As our cardiac output decreases, remember those factors that we look at are stroke volume and heart rate, there's going to be decreased blood flow to the kidneys. And the kidneys are incredibly sensitive to any kind of changes in blood flow. And what they're going to do is try to retain water to increase that blood pressure with the idea that they're going to increase the blood flow that they see. But in return, as that heart is not able to pump any more volume, that fluid has to collect somewhere and it tends to collect in the lungs. If we take a little bit of a closer look at the kidneys, we have the blood that's coming from the body in the renal artery here and the blood that's going away in the renal vein. And this renal artery has a lot of very specialized sensors in it that are able to detect how much blood flow is coming in and going out. And when it detects that the heart is not able to push enough blood to the kidney, it tries to increase blood pressure with the thought that increasing blood pressure will send more blood to the end organs. And the way that it increases blood pressure is to increase salt retention because water follows salt. So if it can keep more salt in the bloodstream, we're going to retain more water and therefore increase preload and increase the blood pressure. Now this is great for the kidneys because they're going to start to see more volume and be able to filter more blood. But it's bad for the heart because the our heart is already struggling to push all that volume out and now you're having more volume and it makes the heart work even harder. So as that heart is having to work harder, especially on that left side, blood is going to tend to collect in the lungs and this causes pulmonary edema. And with the backup of fluid, with a left heart that's not able to push enough volume out efficiently as that volume collects in the lungs, because it's basically a big low pressure space for fluid to collect, those capillaries are going to get overloaded and then they're going to start to leak. And as those capillaries leak, it's going to be harder and harder for those alveoli to do the gas exchange that they're supposed to do. So here's what we see on a CAT scan of a chest when we have a patient that's got too much fluid. We see lungs here. This is the left lung. The heart's in the middle. And then we have the right lung here. But you look at these patchy, fluffy infiltrates here. This is all extra fluid that the heart just can't handle, so it's collecting in the lungs. And there's so much pressure built up that the fluid is actually leaking out of the vascular space and into the chest cavity here. And this is what we call a pleural effusion. So again, if we start with normal, we've seen these normal alveoli before. Lots of white space, one cell layer thick for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange to occur. Nice big alveoli, they're inflated and nothing in the way for that air exchange to go just like it's supposed to. But if you look at a lung that's got pulmonary edema, here we have an alveoli that's full of extra fluid. And there's so much fluid in there that it's increasing what we call oncotic pressure. And it's causing swelling in the interstitium. And it's also causing leakage out into the rest of the chest cavity. And here's just another demonstration of what pulmonary edema actually looks like in the lungs. Here's a cartoon demonstrating the fluid buildup in the alveoli. And this is what it actually looks like if you look at it under the microscope. So you're going to see really edematous cell wall layers with capillaries that are just bulging because there's extra fluid and water. And then the wall is going to be thick. And in between, it's not that nice white anymore. It's this leaky. They're just full of pink fluid where capillaries have ruptured. And the kidneys aren't the only thing that are affected when the heart fails. The brain is also trying to help the body survive and is sending signals to the heart to make it work harder. So the brain is also sensing the decreased blood flow from the pump that's not working, and it activates the sympathetic nervous system. 
And what that does is it's an attempt, again, to increase that cardiac output. Because if you remember, stroke volume and heart rate are the two factors that can control that output. So the brain is acting on the heart rate to increase the cardiac output. It makes the heart beat harder to, again, help with that contractility that's a component of stroke volume. But it causes the patient to feel very restless and anxious. And it also has the ability to kind of shunt blood to the core to perfuse the core organs and decrease blood flow to the extremities. So a lot of times patients with congestive heart failure exacerbations will be cold in their hands and their feet. And that's because their brain is telling their body that it needs to shunt all the blood to the core and perfuse those organs. So if you have a patient with left-sided heart failure, the signs and symptoms you're going to see kind of make sense. If you remember the way blood flows through the heart, the left side, blood is coming to the left side from the lungs and going out to the body. But if the left can't push blood to the body, fluid's going to back up in the lungs. So you're going to have patients that can't exercise like normal. They get hypoxic quickly. They might have a cough with all that fluid in their lungs. You're going to hear crackles and rails. Their alveoli are full of fluid, so they're not going to have normal oxygen levels. The brain is hungry for oxygen, so they might have a little bit of confusion. That sympathetic drive is going, so they might be tachycardic and anxious as well. Now, if we talk about right-sided heart failure, again, just think of where everything backs up into. So on the right side, blood is coming from the body. Remember, that's your deoxygenated blood. And the right side is what's pumping blood to the lungs by the pulmonary artery to pick up oxygen. So if the right side isn't working normally, what you're going to see is jugular venous distension and maybe even some cerebral edema and confusion. And blood will also back up into the abdomen and legs. So you might see a patient that looks like this. They're going to have pitting edema in their lower extremities. And here's a really good picture of jugular venous distension. And all that starts to make sense as you picture the blood just not being able to be squeezed to where it needs to go. And it's backing up in this closed system. So if you're dispatched to a patient with shortness of breath, how can you tell the difference between congestive heart failure and COPD? Because COPD patients a lot of times will have heart failure too. Remember that causes right-sided heart failure. And then left-sided heart failure can also cause right-sided heart failure. So how can you tell the difference? It always comes back to your history and your physical. So things you can ask your patient to help differentiate are, are they gaining weight? A lot of your heart failure patients will be told to follow their weights very closely, and you can tell if they're retaining water. Orthopnea and PND, now I know these are fancy medical terms, but orthopnea basically just means that these patients at night, they're not able to sleep flat because they feel like they're drowning. So you can ask your patients, how many pillows are you using to sleep on at night? And a lot of times your bad heart failure patients will tell you two or three pillows, or sometimes they'll tell you they're not able to lay down at all and they're sleeping in the recliner because if they lay down or recline at all, they can't breathe. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is another fancy medical term. We call it PND for short, but this is basically just a patient who wakes up in the middle of night gasping for air, feeling like they're suffocating. A lot of times heart failure exacerbations happen when patients are eating too much salt in their diet. You can ask them how their food intake has been. I remember when I worked in Tennessee, we used to see a lot of heart failure exacerbations right after Thanksgiving when everybody had a big turkey meal because they were retaining too much water. And have they been taking their medications as prescribed? A lot of times patients don't like to take their medications for heart failure because part of the fundamental treatment is working on the renal system to make them urinate off the extra water. Water, and they don't like to get up in the middle of the night to urinate all the time. And then you can always ask them about their past medical history too. One way that's pretty easy to differentiate COPD from CHF exacerbation is to use your capnography. So a COPD exacerbation, just like we learned before, is going to have a shark fin waveform and you're going to see high end titles with prolonged expiratory phase. But if you have a CHF patient, your end title can range from anything. It can be low, it can be high, but you're not going to have the shark fin waveform. You're just going to have the normal square waveform. So it's a very easy, very effective tool to very quickly tell the difference between both. No matter what, every patient that you go to with shortness of breath, it's imperative that we get a 12 lead. 
And when we're thinking about heart failure, it's just a vicious cycle. So all that physiology that we just went through, if you start here at the top with a myocardial injury, whether that's a heart attack or whether that's an infection or whatever it is that makes this heart not work like it should, that ventricle is going to decrease its performance. And as a result of that, cardiac output is going to decrease. The brain is going to sense that and increase the sympathetic activity and the kidneys are going to sense that and increase the blood pressure and the fluid retention. Well, between the fluid retention and the increased sympathetic activity, that's going to increase the demand on the heart and make it work even harder by having more volume and more oxygen demand. And that's going to, in turn, just create more injury. So it's very important to understand that we need to stop that cycle. And that's where our treatments come in. It is important to realize that these hearts are very sick at baseline, and so any increased insult to these hearts put them at very high risk for arrhythmia. So anytime you have a heart failure patient, especially an end-stage heart failure patient, it's important to keep them on the monitor and anticipate arrhythmias. So our treatment goals when we're trying to treat these patients, it's basically trying to stop that cycle. So we want to reduce how hard the heart is having to work. We want to interrupt that sympathetic activation and reduce that preload. So one of the easiest, most effective treatments that we have is our positive pressure ventilation with CPAP. So by putting positive pressure through that mask, you're going to basically blow air into those alveoli, blow that fluid into the interstitial space where it needs to be, open those alveoli up so they can do their gas exchange, and treat the hypoxia and decrease the preload. And by relieving that patient's hypoxia and work of breathing, you're also going to be decreasing that sympathetic stimulus. So it all works together, and this is a very effective tool in treating heart failure exacerbations and patients that are fluid overloaded. Basically, I give it to any patient where they're hypoxic and I know they have pulmonary edema or they're having really increased work of breathing. There's really no downside to this. So nitroglycerin acts by dilating the veins and arteries and increasing the capacity in the intravascular space and pulling fluid out of the extravascular space. That, in turn, helps decrease the demand on the heart, decreases the autonomic reflexes, and helps decrease the preload that's causing the heart to have to work so hard. Now, it's very important when you're giving nitro to check the blood pressure first because it does have such a potent effect on vasodilation. It can drop the blood pressure precipitously and cause problems with perfusion. Another very important question to ask your male patients is if they're using any drugs like Cialis or Sildenafil that, might, that are acting on the same receptors and might potentiate and cause a very big drop in blood pressure. There is some evidence for nitroglycerin's use in CHF. I know it's become a mainstay in the hospital. The reasons why it's good is it acts very fast. It helps decrease the rates of intubation and keep people out of the ICU and make it where they don't need to stay in the hospital as long. Now, these are emergent treatments, and they haven't been shown to help with mortality, but they will help in the emergent setting where your patient is in distress. One other treatment that we use is Lasix, and I, I always love the way that the kidneys work. But if you look at the kidney and you zoom in, you've got your arterial blood coming in here and your venous blood coming in here, and your kidneys are seeing just as much volume as your heart. So the entire five liters of your blood volume is circulating through your kidneys every single minute. And when it comes in from the renal artery, it gets sent out to these nephrons here. It's the glomerulus. And so... If you look at a close-up of the renal artery, blood is going in to the little glomerulus here, and this is where a lot of your hormone regulation happens to help with your blood pressure. As blood comes in here, hormones are released. It continues through the arterial system, and it is constantly being sensed in terms of what electrolytes are in there and what hormones are in there, and this is where your acid base and sodium regulation occurs. And then as the waste is pulled out and the kidney decides what it wants to keep, the urine is filtered over here, and then the good blood with however much sodium or acid the kidney determines that you need is filtered back to the body to go back to the heart and the lungs. Now, where Lasix works is one of these chloride channels. This is called the loop of Henle. And so Lasix actually blocks a chloride channel so that 
as your body, your kidney is naturally, we talked about before, trying to keep sodium. But what Lasix does is makes your body kick the sodium out. And by kicking the sodium out into the urine, you're also going to be wasting more water. And that's how the body, it's called a diuretic or a water pill, because it's blocking the sodium resorption that's causing your increased preload and increased fluid. Now, if you've heard the phrase pee like a racehorse before, this is where it came from. In 1974, in the Kentucky Derby, Northern Dancer was one of the first racehorses ever to be given Lasix. And the excuse at the time for giving this horse Lasix, it's really pretty interesting, but when horses run, every time they contract their back legs, they essentially squeeze their spleen. And by squeezing their spleen, it increases very violently the preload that comes back to their heart. And so as they're racing and they're running really hard, those hearts are seeing incredibly high pressures and incredibly big venous returns. And as a result, those high pressures are being translated into the lungs and it causes pulmonary hemorrhage in these racehorses. And it can be fatal, but it's fairly common. And so they discovered that if they give these horses Lasix beforehand, they don't have that much volume. They Just like we use it for is to reduce volume, the horse doesn't have as much pulmonary hemorrhage. It's kind of interesting because it's also beneficial for the racer as well because as they pee all that extra volume out, they tend to lose 20 or 30 pounds and it makes them a whole lot faster. So a lot of the jockeys really like it. Interestingly, most countries have banned Lasix use before horse races now because it can be deemed a performance-enhancing drug. It's still legal in the United States, but many other countries don't think that it's fair. So that's all I have for you. If you have any questions, either contact me or let your 7-8 know, and I'm happy to talk about this further.